Good morning, everyone. Oh, it's just so sweet, and I think worship is just so incredibly sweet. Alicia, where are you? Did she go? Oh, I can see her walking out now. Get her, Lord. <laughs> I'll prophesy over her later. Um, I think there's some prophetic words that I would love to just share. Rachel, would you mind come? Rachel has a prophetic word that she wants to share. Um, Rachel's just an incredible leader. Um, she's one of the leaders uh, in the young adults and in church. Uh, she does a lot behind the scenes, uh, but she's an incredible encourager. Um, you definitely want to get around her. You'll just feel uplifted whenever you are around her. So take it away. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, I feel like he just wants to he just wants to let you know that um, yeah that you are just a powerhouse. Like that there's something inside of you that you've never opened before. Um, that he wants to just like break open and just use. Um, I don't know you. I don't know your history, but I really feel like God has highlighted you um, and just wants to let you know that the, what you carry inside is gonna make a huge difference. In, to the people around you, and um, you might think that's like really scary because <laughs> it can be really scary. But um, yeah, you carry something really powerful, and I just want to encourage you with that. Yeah. Well done, Rach. Um, yeah, I just want to carry on with that. I really believe that there is something powerful on you, um, and I really think that the Lord is really raising you up uh, to be um, a voice to this generation. Um, I feel like you lead with such humility. I feel like you raise people up because you go low. Um, and you've, you've had to learn that from a young age. And I feel like the Lord's saying that you're an incredible son. And the best sons make the best fathers. And I feel like you're going to father people. Um, yeah, you're going to have your own kids, yeah, obviously. But I believe you're going to really father people. Um, and the way you lead is alongside people. Um, yeah, you, you love running ahead. But also you love coming alongside because you really have a pastoral compassionate heart. Um, so I just really bless you. And just your shoes are highlighted. I don't know why your shoes are highlighted. Those are really cool shoes, by the way. What are those? Jordans? <laughs> um, but I feel like the Lord is planting you, um, just like what, what the shoes mean. Um, but I feel like there's, there's an incredible peace that you carry um, that when you share the gospel. There's just a beautiful peace that wherever you go, um, you release peace in the atmosphere and the area. Um, so we just bless you wherever you travel um, and your your planting. And I pray that you have a community that comes around you that will uh, encourage you and uh, keep you accountable to what God has called you to, because He's called you to a lot. So bless you, bro. Um, Alicia, that song that you sang about the fire falling down that was there was some power on that. Um, I, I don't know what that was. Um, it was the power of God. But I just, I just honor how uh, that is. I can, you can see that it was birthed in the secret place. You, you have history with that in the secret place. So we just honor that. We honor the what you are bringing um, from last weekend. Uh, we, we honor how you staying in momentum, and you're not allowing it to just be a moment. Uh, we we honor that. I feel like you you have that fire, and you won't let it just be a moment. Um, yeah, we, we need that tenacity that you carry for the presence of God. So we honor you. Great, guys. So last weekend, let's talk about that. Um, that was incredible. Um, just the gift that is on Jean. Um, thanks so much, Sandy. My voice gets really, really good. Uh, people had some life-transforming encounters with the Holy Spirit. Um, I saw one gentleman, he was literally pinned to the ground. Um, he could move his head. He was trying. He was literally trying to get up for probably 30 minutes. Um, and he, he, he couldn't move. 
you, the, the sovereign, the Lord was just sovereignly holding him down under the presence, the, the Shekinah glory of God. Um, and those, those moments mark you. Those moments transform you. But they can't stay a moment. We, we need to step into momentum. I believe this church has stepped into a quickened momentum in the Spirit. And we need to stay in step with the Spirit. And so I'm going to do my best to give us tools and how to walk that out. How to steward encounters um, from what happened last weekend. Because our encounters have to look like something. We can't be so heavenly minded that we know earthly good. We can't just go from Sunday to Sunday, conference to conference, and our lives aren't transformed. We're not walking in a greater level of, of the gifts of uh, the Spirit, but fruit of the Spirit, essentially. I believe the way we do that and steward the encounters is the renewing of the mind. I believe the thing that takes us out of that momentum is an unrenewed mind, old thinking. We go back to old thinking because it's familiar and it's comfortable. And, and that's how we step out of that spiritual momentum. You see, we, we can do all, all we can here, uh, leading the service and all that stuff, but there's a gift inside of you that you need to stir up and bring to the party. We can't be dependent on a gift. We, we, we obviously love gifts when they come and give inputs. We learn from them. But Jesus says, it's better that I go. He left so that we could step into maturity and not just carry on driving, uh, riding a bicycle with fairy wheels. We're going to take those fairy wheels off. All right. So I'm going to talk about new thinking. How do we renew our minds? Uh, Fun story. Let me tell a story. Um, I used to be a kids' church pastor years back, and uh, I, I, we, we did a series called Stinking Thinking, uh, similar to what I'm about to talk about, like old thinking. How do we get out of our old thinking? And I was like, How do we? Firstly, keeping kids' attention for more than five minutes—that's a miracle um, alone. And so I was like, Man, how do we teach these kids? You know, in different ways. I mean, I personally don't learn from a person just like like you are now. <laughs> um, I learn visually, like, I, like if there's a, a video on or, or something like that, or a whiteboard, I've got a whiteboard, I'll bring that later, don't worry. Um, but there are five senses, like how do we teach through the five senses, touch, smell, taste, and the other ones. Um, <laughs> and uh, so I was like, how do we teach, you know, stinking thinking, you know, like we need to stay away from stinking thinking. How do we do this in a memorable way? And so I went after smell, and I got two fish, and I put it in a Tupperware, and I just looked in the fridge for something, and it was like ultramal custard, and that had gone off. So I put ultramal custard in the Tupperware with the two fish, closed it, a nice ice cream container, and uh, left it in the garage for like two weeks to just stew, and it was hot in there. I know. Oh, and you can just imagine, it was growing legs. Uh, it stank. And so the first week came, and I was like, kids, we, we can't afford to have... Oh, I, didn't, I didn't use words like that. Kids, we can't have stinking thinking in our lives. When we have stinking, stinking thinking in our lives, this is what it smells like. And we had these big industrial fans, like those ones we have over there. Switched it on high, opened the container, and all the kids were like, yeah! They try to run out. We locked the doors. Kidding. We didn't lock the doors. Can't do that. Um... But they, they, they learned to the moment, like, stinking thinking's bad. They'll never forget that, I hope. Um, an another, uh, another quick story. Same, same series. I got, uh, it was so much fun. I got Nutella and <laughs> chunky peanut butter, and I mixed it together, put it in a piping bag, and I piped a really nice turd. So it looked like, you know, it did. It looked like that. It's kids church, you know, anything to <laughs> convey the message. I just said that word in church. Um, and I went and I hid it so that we had the lesson. People were, 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 were doing the lesson and I went and hid it in the, in the kids church. And all the leaders knew, knew what was happening. And I had my teacher voice on. And I, I went over to her. I was like, kids, who did this? 
who did this, picked it up, and I was like on a little thingy, <laughs> and I was like, went to the front, all the kids gathered around, was, like, who did this? This is disgusting. We do not do this at church. <laughs> they all gathered around, and little, there was a little kid here, he had thick glasses on, every kid's church has one, uh, a kid like that, and um, he was allergic to everything. First day of kids' church, he showed up with a list of things that he couldn't touch, be around, smell. He was one of those kids. And it was right there. And I was in character. I was like loving us. And I put some on my finger and put it on his nose. And he stood there. He's like. And then I realized he's allergic to nuts. <laughs> we learned how to pray that day. <laughs> he was fine. Uh, he's still fine. Um, that's why I'm no longer in kids' church. Uh, <laughs> but it was great. It was those practical things on uh, on how do you, you know change our thinking. If you listen to uh, Bill Johnson, one of my favorite preachers, majority of his preachers are around renewing your thinking. We can we can uh, talk spiritual, be spiritual, have all the encounters, but if our thinking isn't changing. We're not going to thrive. We're not going to walk those things out. It's so powerful. So let's dig into the scripture that we have today. We are reading from Luke 5, verse 33 to 39. We're currently in a series called Who's Your Daddy? And uh, we, we're digging into like who is the father to us? What characteristics does the father have based off of the book of Luke? Uh, two weeks ago, two weeks ago, Helene spoke on um, verse 17, I think it was, um, on forgiveness and how uh, the paralytic man was was uh, lowered through the ceiling, and Jesus said, um, "Pick up your, your sins are forgiven. Pick up your mat and walk." It offended the Pharisees. Um, it was an incredible preach. I recommend you go and, and listen to it. And then, I'm giving us a bit of a context here. Um, straight after that, Jesus leaves that, that room where he just heals the paralytic man. He walks out, and he sees Levi. A few verses later, he says two words, follow me. Levi stops whatever he's doing. He's a tax collector, the worst of the worst sinners. All right? Stops whatever he's doing and follows Jesus. Levi invites Jesus to dinner. And that's where we're at, where we're at now. What I, what I love is when we read Scripture, we don't know how the you know, gap between Scriptures, the, the gap between chapters, but this is happening all in one day. Jesus is leaving the paralytic man who he just healed, walks out, sees Levi, the tax collector, tells him to follow him, then goes to dinner. That is all happening within a couple of hours. I love, I love context. And so... At Levi's house, Levi has his, has his friends there. The only friends that Levi has at the moment are tax collectors, sinners, the worst of the worst. And the Pharisees are there, and we pick up in verse 33. And they said to him, The disciples of John fast often and offer prayers, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink. And Jesus said to them, Can you make wedding guests fast? While the bridegroom is with them, the days are coming when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and they will fast in those days. He also told them a parable: No one tears a piece of a new garment from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. If he does, he will tear the new, and the piece from the new will not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wine skins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins. And it will be spilled, and the skins will be destroyed. But new wine must be put into fresh wineskins. And no one after drinking old wine desires new, for he says the old is good. So let's read that again. I'm going to break it up and see where we go from there. And he said to them, disciples of John, fast often and offer prayers. And so do the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink. The Pharisees are trying to catch out Jesus here. They are so puffed up on their knowledge of the Old Testament, of the Bible, that 
they know the word so much that when the word incarnate is standing in front of them, they can't see the word. Trying to point out how righteous they were because of their old traditions and their old rule keeping. Jesus said to them, can you make wedding guests fast while our bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and they will fast in those days. Jesus is referring to himself as the bridegroom and saying, I'm right here in front of you guys. You don't need to fast. You don't need, to, you don't need sharper focus. I'm right here in front of you. You see, fasting is incredible because what it does is it throws off distraction and it puts focus onto Jesus. But Jesus is right in front of them. They don't need to do that. Do you know that in heaven you won't be fasting? This side, we, 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 we're not in heaven now, but we, we do fast. We contend. You know, we need that sharper focus. But in heaven, we won't be fasting because we'll be face-to-face -face with Jesus. We, uh, heaven is often described as a wedding feast. The contrast here is that it's a celebration in heaven why, why are you guys fasting? Why are you guys putting yourselves through these things when I'm right here in front of you? Open your eyes. Look at me. I'm here. He also tells a parable. No one tears a piece of, from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. If he does, the new will tear and the piece from the new will not match the old. What he's talking about is teenagers who wear jeans that have holes in them. <laughs> Kidding. He's not doing that. He's not giving advice on fashion. What he's doing is he's actually, um, he's talking about if you have an old clothing uh, with a hole in it and you put a patch on it, you sew a patch on it, you end up washing it. It actually tears away from the old and ruins the whole thing. He's saying it's a waste. Don't do that. Don't mix the old with the new. Verse 37, another example, another parable. No one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does... The new wine will burst the skins and it will be spilled and the skins will be destroyed and the new wine, but the new wine must be put into fresh skins. Say fresh skins. My knowledge of wine isn't that great besides that it tastes good. Um, and I did a bit of research and uh, back in the day they would use animal skins to hold the wine um, so they could carry it around and also help the fermentation process um, because the, the, the wine skin would need to expand um, as it's going through that fermentation uh, process. Um, and apparently you could only do that once with the wine skin. If you, if you did it again with that old wine skin, that wine skin has already reached its capacity of stretching and, stretching and expanding. And so you put new fresh wine skin in there and it would ferment, and because there's no give in the, the wineskin, it would burst. So what I believe the Lord is saying to us is that we need an upgrade in our wineskin. New wine has been poured out. We need an upgrade in our wineskin, and I believe the wineskin is our thinking. It's not a once-off thing that we do. I believe it's a daily thing, a daily New wineskin, new thinking, not going back to the old. Jesus is saying there's so much I want to give you, so many places that I want to take you, but you need to give up the old. Just imagine a person holding uh, a box. You can't give that person anything. They need to put that down so that they can receive something new. You need to give up the old. If you think of the Israelites, they left cap captivity, they left Egypt. And then they, 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 you know, they're leaving, they're celebrating their freedom, which is fascinating. They, I mean, they, they're born into slavery. And that would just be fascinating leading that um, group of people. Anyways, so they're leaving Egypt. All right, then they, they, they get to the, the Red Sea. Um, they hear that the chariots are chasing them, and they desire to go back to the old. Oh, Moses, why did you bring us out here to die? We would rather go back to slavery where there's comfort, where there's, there's our house, there's our bed. 
basic things. Rather go back to the old and then instead of coming here to a sea. But then what God does is he splits the sea, he parts the sea. When Jesus is filled with the Holy Spirit, um, you know, he gets baptized. And then the, the dove descends on him. He's, he's filled with the Holy Spirit. And then, boggles my mind, the Holy Spirit leads him into the desert to be tempted by Satan. For 40 days, tempted by Satan. And then he leaves in power. And so what, what's happening in the desert is Jesus is being tempted. His mind is, is at war in his mind, in his thinking. He's having to rebuke Satan with scripture, with truth. And that, that is building him up. That, that's building up his character and, and his knowledge that he is walking in this authority. And he leaves the desert in power. See, we can be filled with the Holy Spirit. We can have these encounters. But we need to go through these moments where we're rebuking Satan and walking in truth. That's where we step into the power. Some old thinking that I know I certainly have related with in the past. But old thinking is independent from God. There's no need for a savior. It's self-reliant, self-dependent, self-righteous. What is this word self-righteousness? I feel like we throw it around. In church, I don't think we actually understand it. So to be righteous means to be in right standing with God. It doesn't mean we're equal with Him. It means that we're made, we're co-heirs with Jesus. We're in our sons and daughters. We're in right standing with Him because of the blood of Jesus. Being self-righteous means that you have worked your way to being right with God, what the Pharisees were doing. Oh, but we're fasting. We're keeping all these traditions. We are righteous. Those things aren't bad, but if you're doing it out of your own will and ability, it's self-righteousness. We need to stay dependent on God. See, Jesus didn't account equality with God as something to be attained. He gave up his divinity, his power, and walked in uh, dependence on the Holy Spirit. Jesus did that. He could only do what the Father was doing. He could only do something through that right relationship with God. What I do makes me righteous. It's a belief that our moral doing earns our way into heaven. It's a belief that our moral doing uh, makes God happy with us. If you struggle with self-righteousness, often you're comparing yourself with other people. You struggle with competition. Jealousy often comes up with you because of that comparison. Often we're led by our need to do church duty instead of our need and love for Jesus. We treat the secret place like a box to be ticked. We isolate ourselves instead of living openly in community. Often people in old thinking live in habitual sin patterns, thinking that something outside of God will satisfy them. Struggle to live vulnerably due to the fear that they will be rejected. Struggles to surrender their intellect. If you think of Nicodemus, He goes to Jesus and he says, he's talking about being born again. Jesus is like, you need need to be born again. And Nicodemus, the Pharisee, he's like, he doesn't understand. Like, must I go back? He literally says, must I go back into my mother's womb? See, the things of the spirit can't be comprehended in the intellect. It's not that we do away with intellect. Man, we need more intellectual people. Um, It's not that we do away with it. 
but often that can be a barrier from you experiencing the Holy Spirit. We're good at surrendering our hearts, but our thinking is a place that we want to control and understand and plan. The new mindset can look something like this. The new mindset welcomes change, welcomes mystery, welcomes feedback because their identity is found in Jesus and not man's approval. They're led by the impulses of the Holy Spirit. doesn't allow their past to speak louder than truth. They firmly believe that their old nature is dead and as a result confident, confidently enter into the presence of God. They recognize their need for a savior. That it's not a once-off sticking your hand up at an altar call, but a constant lifestyle of surrender. Aren't, oh, they aren't disgusted by sin or sinners, but are moved by compassion to walk them on a journey of reconciliation to the Father. They're motivated by love and is no longer allowing fear, fear to fuel their success. We all, we all have old thinking. We, we all have old thinking that we get to repent from, turn away from. And so man, repentance is a, is a beautiful gift. It's a beautiful gift. It's going, oh God, sorry I was finding satisfaction in this area. Sorry I was finding significance in this area. I'm going to turn away from this and choose to believe this, choose to walk this out. Good guys, can I get the whiteboard, please? Um, I really want to just have some practical tools to leave you with, because we we need to stay in that momentum. We we need to. It can't be a, a just a once-off encounter. Thanks, bro. Basically, just it's A B C D. That's what it is. Um, and this is just a really basic tool. Uh, at the top, it says activating events. B belief. C consequent emotion. D dictated behavior. And um, often we have. Cycles of thinking uh, that that really aren't helpful, and we need to become aware of these cycles of thinking, and allow God's new thinking to be put in place to break that cycle. All right, so we're gonna get really practical. Is that okay? Cool. So activating events. So something happens, and you're triggered. Here, you you're in a situation. I'm gonna give an example. This is a made up example. Sandy, I'm gonna pick on you if that's okay. Sandy is probably like the most welcoming, happy person, so this isn't true of her, okay? Um, but uh, in activating events, uh, you have Sandy, oh, thank you, Jesus. Um, you have Sandy at church, and you, you, you come to church one Sunday morning, and Sandy doesn't say hello to you. You, you walk past Sandy, you say, hello, Sandy, and she literally doesn't respond. Activating event. Something happens. And as a result of that encounter, you believe something about yourself. You have a story that you're telling yourself. Some of the guys who are doing the counseling course know this. Um, so you, you have a, a belief about yourself. And so Sandy didn't say hello to you. She didn't greet you when you said hello. And your belief could range from many different things. For me, it would probably be, oh, Sandy doesn't love me. I'm not lovable. And you spiral. All the way down, oh, I'm not lovable. People don't love me. I'm not welcome. I'm not seen. Those beliefs. So you're thinking you're not loved here. Right? That would result in a consequent emotion. So probably the emotion I would feel there is anxiety, insecurity, fear. Like what, what, is, what did I do? Did I not respond to her? Did I forget something? Can she prophetically see the sin in my life? You know... I, <laughs> we all think these things, guys. Come on. 
<laughs> so, so we have these uh, insecurities, sorry. Um, and so you're feeling insecure, yeah. Uh, you're feeling anxiety, right? Your heart's racing. And then as a result, you have a behavior. So next time you see Sandy in the shopping center, you're going to probably hide away because you don't want to go through that again. You don't want to go through that rejection again. All because you chose to partner with something here. Or you could hide away. You could, you know, sit on the other side of the church and Sandy's sitting over here. Um, or you could really perform for her. You could go, oh, Sandy doesn't love me. That means I need to do something to make her love me. So when I see her next time, I'm going to go to her and tell her about this amazing testimony that I had with Jesus so she'll think highly of me. You see the different ways we can respond. The different ways, we, many different ways. And you just create a cycle here. What you can do is you can go, oh, well, Sandy has three kids. And, you know, you probably had a busy morning and all of these things, which is true. Those are factual things. People are busy. Um, some people just don't, don't notice people walking past you. Um, she, is hosting, she was hosting this morning's meeting. She might be busy thinking about that stuff. Those are true things. Very true. Or we can put in a new belief that you aren't dependent on another person's love. That you're only dependent on what God says about you and the Father's love for you. We've got to put in It says new if you can't see. <laughs> um, see, in this space, this happens, this literally happens, I think, I, honestly, I think a thousand times a day. And we need to go on the process of renewing our minds and putting new thinking here. Catching thoughts that are rebellious. Second Corinthians 10 verses 5, it says, um, uh, Take, take captive rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. So take captive rebellious thoughts, that's one thing, and then teach them to obey Christ. And so we need to see, so we have a, a response here, and it's going to be a belief system, a thought, something, and we need to take those thoughts captive, right, and take them to the foot of Jesus, what do you say about Jesus? What do you say about this, Jesus? Is this truth? Right? If it's not truth, if it's inferior, we throw it at the foot of the cross. What's going to happen is when we understand the love of the Father and getting that identity from Jesus here, it's going to result in confidence. Right? And so that when you step over here, you'll say hello to Sandy, whether she responds or not. We, we can't be dependent on how people treat us. We need to be dependent on what the Father says about us. People have stuff. We, we can't be victims on, oh, well, we're a church. They have to say hello. It's just an example, guys. But we, we, we can't play that, oh, well, they deserve, I deserve this. They should be doing this for me. We need to take these thoughts captive. And teach them to obey Christ. That, that, that taking thoughts captive, you're only going to recognize a lie when you know truth. And so what we need to do is be constantly in the Word of God. Constantly studying truth where we understand the character and nature of God. And so when a lie comes up that opposes that, I recognize it. You guys get that? That's really... Another way to do to recognize lies is is to be in um, just like Christian community where people are outworking this the Bible, where are living out the Bible. People learn through observation. You know, you might not have br been brought up in a family with parents who are, are believers, uh, so you get around a family who are believers, and you learn how they operate. You're seeing truth in action. So you're learning what truth is. So when you see a lie come along, you go, ah, oh, that's different to what I've seen. That's the difference from a truth. 
I take that captive and I take it to Jesus. Jesus, what do you say about this? Ah, that's a lie. And I teach it to obey Christ. This is really practical, but I really believe that there's, there's something powerful that the Lord has done uh, in this church, and I believe that we need to walk it out. We need to stay in momentum, uh, stay in step with what the Lord has done. Um, could the worship band come on up? We're going to step into a time of communion. The beautiful thing about communion, we're going to go into a, a time of communion now. Um, the beautiful thing about communion is every time we do it, we do it in remembrance of Him. So there's nothing special about you know, the, the juice or the wafer. It's, it's an activation to remind us of what Jesus has done. It's renewing our minds. There are many things that we can do to help us renew our minds. That's why we do communion. Jesus, thank you for what you're doing in this church. Thank you that the old is gone and the new is here. The old is gone and the new is here. Father, right now just reveal old thinking that you want us to turn from. Reveal old thinking that you want us to repent from. Thank you that repentance is a beautiful thing. You have something better for us. You have something better for us. Jesus, thank you that, that by your Holy Spirit, you'll bring up old thinking whenever we trigger throughout the day, throughout our lives. And it's an invitation for an upgrade. It's an invitation for better thinking. Heaven's thinking, your thinking. So right now, Father, I just release a grace to take thoughts captive. To highlight lies and teach them how to submit to you, Jesus. God, we're not going back, Father. We're not going back, Father. Father, I pray for the courage to stir up the gift that is within us individually at home, not waiting for a Sunday. We want to stay hungry, Father. We want to stay hungry for the plans and purposes of you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. to do it without the Holy Spirit. It's probably even dangerous to do it without the Holy Spirit. Oh, we're, we're in need of you, Holy Spirit. Oh, we have you, but we're in need of you. We have you, but we're in need of you. I honor your Holy Spirit in this place. I honor you, Holy Spirit. Come, Father. Come, Father. Fresh revelation. Fresh revelation. I'm going to invite you to, in your own time, you could just stay in, the, in this place with a heart posture focused on Jesus in your own time going and grabbing communion and as you're taking of the, the blood and the body just allow your thoughts to be lined up with his thoughts and step into that beautiful repentance of turning away from the old and choosing to walk in the new